Dr. Daoud Zatari uh, is an important figure in Palestine. He had been an important figure even before he became mayor of Hebron. He was the uh, president of the city's Polytechnical University, which those of you who know Hebron know that it's a first-rate school engineering school. He's a distinguished uh, researcher in telemedicine and uh, biomedical engineering. In 2012, and many of you already know this too, uh, he found a way to get back to his community by becoming mayor of the largest city uh, in the West Bank. And it's not an easy job because in 1997, uh, an agreement between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, Hebron was divided and settlers were allowed to live in the heart of Hebron. And this, of course, if you're administering a city, if you're mayor, uh, presents enormous challenges. And I'm very much looking forward to what uh, Mayor Satari will tell us about some of the difficulties that he's facing, challenges he's facing, and successes and opportunities for the future uh, as he shines a spotlight on this largest city in, in the West Bank. So, uh, Dr. Satari, welcome. And uh, please, the, uh, the podium is yours. You, uh, Dr. Satari wants to give a few remarks for about 20 minutes or so, and we'll have to show a, a, a video, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you so much for uh, coming to see us and to listen to us. And uh, I appreciate uh, this kind of arrangements from the Middle East Institute, which I believe my capacity as a mayor of the city of Hebron Maybe some of you have visited Palestine, and some of you might have an idea about the situation in Palestine. I uh, just want to share some, some thoughts with you all, and maybe we can have some discussion or some questions, uh, exchange of ideas and thoughts about the situation that is really going on, and what's really the future of the conflict? Because we have so many things now on the ground, whether in at the political level or at the economical level, or what's really going on in the reality and the behavior of the Israeli government and the problems that we are facing with regard to our leadership and the Israeli leadership to resume the negotiation process, which we were talking about it since 1994, after Oslo agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, when Oslo took place, we before Oslo we had we went through a very rough time in Palestine, facing the existing situation in the West Bank and also in Gaza, and we have lost many lives. We have thousands of people were captured in and put in jails and in military detentions. Some people faced huge uh, damages in, we, we, we faced a huge damage in, in the economy and also we received and we actually had several homes were destroyed and damages by the Israeli military and Israeli occupation. However, we got some hope in 1994 
and we thought that we can wait. We waited since 1948 until passed through 1967, and we came to 1994 when our ex-president, Mr. Arafat, agreed with the Israelis that within nine, within five years, from 94 till 99, we really should have a Palestinian state on the basis of two-state solutions and also to have the final and clo to close the situation after five years. But the, unfortunately, the five years gone, 22 years now gone, and what happened and what you have seen maybe on the media and on the ground, the people since the end of September, young generation, I'm talking about young boys and girls who were born after 1994. I'm not talking about a generation of my age. I'm talking as a generation, young generation. University students, school boys and girls, they, they found out that they are stuck. They, we entered into a tunnel of negotiations with the Israelis and we found out that we are in a very dark tunnel. Even there is no signs or hope to see the light and to exit of the tunnel. And the situation remains as is until today. That's why the incidents that happened in Jerusalem and in the city of Hebron, my city, and also spread it to Ramallah, spread it to all over the West Bank. That was just an expression of anger in my capacity as a mayor. I say, I disagree with anybody who says this is intifada or this is uprising, third uprising or whatsoever, because none of the political stream is really behind this or behind what happened since the last couple of months. But the people, the young generation, they are saying to our leadership and also sending messages to the Israelis, enough is enough. We are fed up. We have no future. We have no jobs. We have thousands of our young graduates from universities are unemployed. Our economy, Despite the fact that sometimes the World Bank, in the last couple of years, they showed some indexes and figures that the Palestinian economy is recovering. Soon after a year or two years, they, come out, they came out with different figures and different conclusions. We are surviving, but we are not improving in our economy. We are not able to find jobs for our people. I'm talking to you, I was a president of two different universities for 15 years before becoming a mayor. The Polytechnic University in Hebron and Khaduri University in Tulkarm, one in the south, one in the north. So I served, I served across all, of, all over the country and we graduated thousands of people. I can tell you very few of them are placed in jobs. When I was telling my president, our president, our prime ministers, we really need to build our economy in the right shape. But unfortunately, we have so many obstacles and so many problems to build the economy. First of all, we rely heavily on international support and donations. And the USAID is one of the major supporters for our uh, projects, for our development. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the reasons why I came to the United States, because we have the money that was allocated by the Congress since 2014. And now, until now, we have $290 million were put on hold. 
they were called because the Palestinians, they are doing for the sake of freedom. And we, of course, our leadership went to the United Nations. We were advised by the US not to go to the United Nations. But I can tell you, our president, when he went to the United Nations, he went under the pressure of the people. He had no other choices. The process of negotiation is put in jeopardy and is stopped. Why it is stopped? Stopped because for one reason, Mr. Netanyahu, he wants to keep his government on. He had major, minor majority in his cabinet. So if any of the groups or the political groups from the right wing will pull out, then his government will really collapse. So this is, you know, a, a problem for him to come to negotiate with the Palestinians. The expansion of the settlements as well is continuous. Confiscation of lands is continuous until today. So we really have no much land uh, left for us to have a Palestinian state. And when we say a Palestinian state, we just say it on the basis of the UN resolutions, on the basis, basis of uh, 1997 United Nations resolutions and security councils. We are not asking more than that. We want really to live in peace, to live in dignity next by to the Israeli state. That's all what we need. So the president, our president, when he got non-full membership in the United Nations, do you think this is to the satisfaction of the Palestinians? No. It's just one step, but this is not the final step. Even if we got full membership without ending the occupation, also we do not have the satisfaction, because our satisfaction is to have no occupation. Coming back to problems and the economy, why our president or prime minister could not really manage to help in building the economy, because of the borders, for example. They are fully controlled, surface, air, sea, everything is controlled by the Israelis. When I say the sea, talk about Ashdod board. If any Palestinian businessman, he wanted to invest from inside or from outside, he wants to set up a manufacturing plant, he needs to get raw materials from Turkey, from or Europe, from US, from anywhere, he will have a hard time to get it through the port uh, to be released out of it. It's not difficult to get it to the port, but it is difficult to release it out of the port, being that this material will come to the Palestinian Authority area. So it will undergo a you know, very complicated process for security checks. Whereas the same thing, if it comes to an Israeli factory, it will be released within hours or within one or two days maximum, even if it has to go through security checks. I'm talking about things on practice. I'm not just talk talking just for the sake of talking. This is really what happened. So some is Palestinian businessmen, they decided recently to move their businesses to some other countries like Jordan. Before the problems in Egypt, some Palestinians, they went to Egypt to make businesses in Egypt and some into North Africa, to Morocco. This is again, you know, against our economy. When we talk about other things, water issue. Water. Israel has never had any problem in the amount of water. They have a surplus amount of water. But for me as a mayor, my city with a population 270,000 inhabitants inside the city, and I have 800 inhabitants in the district of my city, in, my, in Hebron district. We need for the city itself 40,000 cubic meters on, for the, on daily basis. What I received, I received 20,000 on daily basis. So this means 
I'm in short of 50%. When we buy the water, even though we have a Palestinian reservoir and wells, but some of them we are not allowed to dig and get water out because some of the wells are located in Area C. Maybe some of you knows about Area C, Area B, Area A in Palestine. As a matter of fact, two-thirds of the Palestinian land is Area C. One-third is Area B, uh, 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 AB or A. So we have a full control over Area E as Palestinians. We have a control on over Area B, but security-wise, we have to coordinate with the Israelis. Or Area C is under full control from all aspects with the Israelis. So if I talk about my city, the city of Hebron, when I say the city is also another complication, the city is also divided into H1 and H2, this division also creates huge, amount, huge problems for us. Why? Because H1 area represents about 60% or 65% of the population, H235, but H1 and H2 are, are separated. I don't want to refer to, Ber to Berlin Wall when it separates East and West Germany, but in Hebron, it is comparable to that. They are separating the two parts of the city with one of very important roads, it's one kilometer road called Ashuhada Street. It was closed by the military since 1997 after the massacre that took place in my city in 1994 when one doctor, a Jewish doctor, I think he was from the US, came to Hebron on the Friday prayer. He was in the settlement of Geriat Arba. He committed suicide, he killed about 29 persons who were doing their Friday prayer in the morning in the Al-Ibrahim Mosque. Same day also injured about 100, over 100 persons, close to 150 in total. As a result of that, because the Abrahim Mosque is under the Israeli security control, so they make and they made formation of a committee of investigation group. That investigation group came out with punishment for the Palestinians, cl closure of around over 500 shops, cl military closure, and also another shops, even more, another. Uh, about over 500 also they were closed, but not with military order for temporary closure. Closure not allowed to come to the, their zones. So we talk about a total of 1,200 shops that remain closed until today. Also, they took over the old vegetable market, the bus station. I'll show how the street is closed. The old city and the surroundings of the old city, six spots they were placed with about 400 to 450 Israeli settlers residing or is it, uh, uh, living inside the old city and placing for them near to the Palestinian people and they took over some Palestinian people homes. So, however, those 400 Closure of the, 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 the street really changed the lives of, the, of my, my, my citizens in my city. And instead of moving from north to south, from H1 to H2, instead of moving in five minutes, I have to travel in my car 35 minutes to go to find alternative routes from the east side or from the west side. That's also another example of the damage of our economy. My losses and my capacity as a mayor, I submit just two months ago a report to my prime minister. I told him, here is my losses. 
taxes that I supposed to collect from people should their homes or their uh, places are not closed, places, properties that are under military or settlement control, I lost as a municipality one million shekel, about one million shekel. When we say shekel to dollar, it's four shekels equivalent to one dollar, something like that. So this is just the municipality losses. What about the people losses? Uh, that's, uh, that really makes more difficulty for building our economy. Despite the fact that Hebron, who, for those who visited Hebron, Hebron is the most important city in terms of industry. It's an industrial city, business city, commercial city. We have really, you know, our economy, the, the PA economy, uh, heavily relies, about 40-45% relies on the Hebron city economy and industry. But even though we have lots of difficulties to provide water to our people, because when I say, when I talked about water, we have shortages of water, so sometimes I am, I left that I'm unable to provide those people who want to invest. They need electricity, they need water, they need all the infrastructural means to make their businesses successful. Sometimes I feel I cannot really do that for them. Now we managed to solve the, the timberal, we managed to solve the issue of the pro, of water because the USAID, thanks for them, thanks for the US government, thanks for the US taxpayers, and I'm sure thanks for all of you, you are a taxpayers. Myself was a taxpayer when I was living in the United States in the 90s, and I got my education from the States in the 90s. So thanks for every American who really help the Palestinians uh, to promote the economic development and to promote some projects for the municipalities, for the local authorities. I assure you 100% that your money is really spent in the right way, in the right direction. And this is one of the reasons of my coming myself and with my colleague, the Mr. Basil Herbawi. He is the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce in my city. So we are coming to, first of all, to thank the American people for, the, for their contribution to help us through the USAID agency. And secondly, we want really to urge you and to urge your institute here and to urge everybody in his capacity really to help us to do your contacts or to your talks or your writing to your senators, to your Congress people, Congress representatives, really to help us to release the money that was held. Uh, because the money, I say to you, it goes to the people, improvement of life, to, to help in improving the life of the citizens. It doesn't go to any political group or to the Ministry of Finance or to the government, it, does, it just comes and monitored 100% by the USAID agency, which contracts with an American contractor. And the American contractor, on the other hand, he contracts with the subcontractors under full management and supervision of the agency of the, the USAID. We met some people from the State Department two days ago. We met also some Congress senators. We met with some American institutions and agencies. And I'm pleased now with my colleague to meet with all of you and to share some thoughts together and to tell you that our people really, they are pro peace. They are against violence. And anyone who really have, or if any message comes, whether through the media or through other means, to you as Americans, that the people of Palestine, they are really raising tension, and they are not really interested in getting the situation to stability. No, this is a wrong message. If you have an insight, feeling or insight, understanding that we are supporting as supporting the tension or increase of violence, no, this is not true. 
because we are a pro peace. We are looking for our freedom. We are working on the two state solution. I know Mr. Netanyahu had difficulty, and I know that the American, they also had difficulty to convince the Israeli administration, but I'm sure for the sake of the future, for the sake of our people and the Israeli people, we have we have no problem to, to live with in peace with the Israelis. I, myself, personally, and Mr. Uh, um, the chamber of the, the the chair of the chamber of commerce. We have we do businesses. Our local companies we do businesses with Israeli companies on daily basis. So the people they interact on daily basis. The problem is the settlements. The problem is the wish and will by Netanyahu really to sit with the Palestinian leadership. And if they say that the Palestinians are not really committed for peace, we don't have somebody to talk to. No, I tell you, Mr. Abu Mazen, he has, he has the full support and full commitment and obligation of all political streams in West Bank and Gaza, even from Hamas. If from in, in, they, they are supporting the two-state solution. We are not, we talk on one, in, in, in one voice for the two-state solution. We may have differences, internal differences, like any other country. They do have differences in their views, in their thinking or whatsoever. But I assure you, in my capacity as a mayor, elected by my people who represent maybe one third of the West Bank, we are pro peace against violence. And by the way, you know, I just get, as an example, I, I just want uh, to inform you that when, when the last incident that happened and took place in France, in Paris, I was the first mayor in the whole Middle East, probably, to send condemnation letter and to send condolences, to express our condolences to the mayor of Paris and to the officials in the, who were representing the French government in my country. So we are, we, co we are committed and we want really to live in dignity. And I really appreciate your support if you can really put some input from your side to get over to the USAID money. By the way, the money was before, it used to be over $300 million. It came back to 290. We hope in the next coming years to push it so that it will be uh, come to get back to normal and uh, the American people will understand that the Palestinian people and the Israeli people, they are willing to live side by side. Uh, what happened, the killing, last killing that happened in, in, in Palestine, in my city, uh, the boys and girls who lost their lives, uh, maybe some of you heard from the media, and I assure you that I, I, I had several statements, even in the Israeli media, that what happened over there could have been not happened if the will and intention of the Israeli military was not to use excess of force at that time. 57 lives were lost in my district, in my city, we could have saved 55 if the will was not to increase tension and not to give strict orders to the soldiers and to the settlers. But anyway, that's what happened. We don't have really to, to look for, the, for our back. We have to look for uh, the front. And we uh, just uh, uh, told the Israelis in several occasions, please reopen reopen the exits that was closed, remove the checkpoints, make life easier for our people, and we are ready. Have the intention for stopping the expansion of the settlements, and we are ready. And I'm telling you as American, we are ready for peace. We are always ready for that. I'm really so sorry for coming a couple of minutes late, but I was informed about the meeting about 10 o'clock. So there was misunderstanding between here, the management of the institute, and the management in my office. So it's, uh, it's my apology again for that. Thank you so much, and I will be sharing 
some discussion follow us together. Thank you. Did you want to show film? Okay. You want to show film? There is no film. Oh, okay. Okay. Would you like to sit in the chair or okay. answer questions? No, it's okay. No problem. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very eloquent uh, discussion on what is happening and the challenges that you face. We promised that you'd talk about the challenges that you face uh, as mayor. It's grim. It's not easy. I'm. My first question before I turn it over to the audience is about the future. You know, you live in a very, very difficult neighborhood. The entire Middle East is in turmoil. Uh, many analysts are saying that uh, what is happening in the Middle East is a, uh, a revolution of sorts, the slow boil revolution, where the people are beginning to uh, re-examine and redefine their relationships with the uh, with their r rulers. Uh, with their governments, uh, the social compact, political compact that has existed for decades is being challenged by the youth, by a demographic that is now the majority in many countries, I believe in the West Bank as well. Uh, you talk about uh, the young people who have no hope, have no jobs, uh, who are saying enough is enough. How do you see the future? What are these youth going to do uh, is you know worst case scenario uh, they uh, begin to see some some interest in Daesh as other youth in other countries have I mean, uh, Palestine has been a bit spared of that uh, or or are the youth going to leave and if they're going to leave where are they going to go uh, or are they going to turn against uh, government leaders What's going to happen after uh, Abu Mazen leaves? A lot of questions about the future. Uh, if you could just share share your thoughts. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if my voice is here. For yeah, no, it's working. If you want me, I can use the... No, it's working. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, this uh, raising this uh, question. It's very important. What's next? What we're going to have for the future for our young generation? Uh, yes, I agree with you. First of all, the young generation, by the fact that they are losing hope and the optimism is now declining day after day, particularly after with the existence of a liquid uh, government or a government from the right wing. Uh, but what really going to happen First of all, the Palestinian Authority security, they have very important role. We don't want really to have things like what is happening in some regional countries, Daesh or other things. No, we have, they, have no, they have no room in, 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 in Palestine. And there is very important role the BA are doing regarding the security issue, internal security issue. But we have limited control over security. So we cannot really grant this for the future because if I don't have security control over two thirds of the land, what you should not really have more expectation. You should not raise up your expectation of control from the Palestinians because they don't have the full land to control. That's one thing. The other thing, I give you an example for those boys and girls, some of them really thought, why we have to go to school? Why we have to spend thousands of dollars or shekels and dinars, and then after that, we have no jobs? But no, we, in, the, in our capacity, in institutions, mayors, the Palestinian Authority government, we push for education, we push for improving health, because we believe if we are not going to have conflict, so there is a solution for the conflict at this time, we have really to build ourselves internally. We have really to build our institutions. We have to educate our people.
to provide better economy. That's why, you know, I am stressing on the USAID money that should really come to us in the, as soon as possible because this will reduce, this will give some hope to the youth, to the young people and the youth people. It will give them some hope because they will have some jobs. If the Black and Veatch, which is a contractor with the USAID, if they are contracting with the Palestinian subcontractors, this means that some of those uh, Young, boy, uh, young people will be employed by the subcontractors. So you are now dragging them. You are dragging them to even, not even to think of leaving the country. That, that's in one hand and on the other hand, also not to have ambiguous future for in their thoughts. So I think where we are going now, we are going from our point of view, for two-state solution. From the Israeli point of view, point of their view is they want to go for one-state solution. So we have now contradiction. We are not in agreement. We, we think something and they think otherwise. But what's the future for the people? This is what we have to think. Under no circumstances, our people will not compromise or tolerate other than a Palestinian state. Even if we don't find solution for the conflict now, it, it, and, and at the time of Netanyahu, or maybe maybe some other people will come after Netanyahu, Netanyahu and his uh, his government and his uh, people, they really understand that the Palestinians. If you talk about the population, we are about six million. When we talk about uh, West Bank, Gaza and the Palestinians who are with Israeli citizenship, we talk about six million, close to six million. We're not talking about the Palestinians who are in exile outside. When we talk about the Israelis, there are six to seven millions also. So you cannot really rule out the existence of this equal number, approximately. So for that reason, our country is very small, from north to south. East-West is very small country. It's not like here in the States. When I go to California, you have to pick up flight to take five, six hours flying. No, yeah, there you can buy car five hours. So this means that we have really to live in. We, we, we cannot repeat also the uh, what happened in 1948. People, Palestinians left to Arab countries. We, in 1967, some people also left to Jordan. And now, if some right-wingers from the Palestinian, from the Israeli side, they believe that they will push the Palestinians to exile, this is impossible. This is impossible for that reason. If we cannot, if we, if we, we tell our people, we tell the young generation, if there will be no solution now, the solution, this means we, remain, we prefer to remain under occupation rather than compromising for our state, for our rights for our state. Yes, just one more question. Um, I, uh, you make a very compelling case that uh, this money is being blocked uh, by Congress for USAID, yes. and it's essential for your economy, it's essential for your development. I, I, I may be president of the Middle East Institute, but my heart is in development as well, and that's why I sit on the board of one of the partners that works in Hebron, Global Communities. And I know they are building schools and doing a, a number of projects with you there. But they have a problem, too, as you point out, as your businessmen uh, have. Uh, even these development agencies have problems getting the supplies that they need uh, for their project. What, what can you do and what can the good people in this audience do to uh, sort of unblocking the, the, uh, the, the movement of, of building material and aid that uh, is coming from abroad, from the United States, to the people of, of the West Bank and Palestine? Well, we have to differentiate between uh, for the, 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 uh, the materials that is coming from inside or from outside. We don't have a problem if the CHF, the global communities, they have a project and they want to do it in Jenin or in Hebron. They don't have a problem to get the materials for the project from inside. But whereas 
even from Israeli companies, there is no problems. But uh, uh, to get things from outside, especially there are some there are some restrictions for some chemical materials. There are some restrictions for the high tech machinery for you know making some factories or some production lines. Sophisticated technologies they have also security uh, implications. Uh, anything related to, uh, to to the improvement of uh, the industry in the high tech sector uh, might also examine some kind of you know uh, examination from security point of view. But they don't block uh, things like that comes from China for uh, you know clothes, for shoes, for uh, you know personal belongings. Be belongings that's not really an issue. But for regarding to your point. For your uh, for the agencies, if they receive the money from the USAID, they can easily we can easily arrange for them the materials, the construction materials, the computers, for example. If they want to equip a, a laboratory in computers and something, it's not really also a problem because the American uh, companies they have uh, branches in, uh, in, in Israel, they have agents, they have distributors, etc. All these things can really come without any difficulty. And I really thank the, since you are in the board of uh, the global communities and the CHF, we have, we are working very closely with them and they support it. They are, they have very efficient uh, projects and uh, they did enormous job uh, in, in the whole West Bank. I'm not talking about the, my city. Even my city and my municipality we received from them also some kind of projects through USAID. Question right here. Uh, please uh, wait for the microphone, and then if you could introduce yourself, uh, and if you have an affiliation, uh, let us know. Um, Mr. Mayor, salam alaikum. I uh, my my name is Michael Kurtzig. I worked in the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1995. In fact, met with people in Gaza and the West Bank and Jordan to put together some regional economic cooperation. At that time, didn't go very far, unfortunately. But would you discuss a little bit the fact that what we're hearing is that the Palestinian people have lost confidence in Abu Mazen and the Palestinian government? And would you also discuss a little bit the role of Hamas, the increasing role of Hamas? We hear ISIS. And as of yesterday, what I read, Iran is having an increasing influence in both in the West Bank and in, in, uh, in Gaza. What are the implications of that? Thank you very much. Well, uh, regarding, you know, the first part of the question, whether the people are, uh, you know, supporting Abu Mazen or not, you know, Abu Mazen came by election. And uh, that election, you know, he had vast majority when he got, whether from Hamas or from Fatah or from any Palestinians. And mind you, the majority of the, pe of the Palestinians are not belonging neither to any political stream majority of the Palestinians, they don't belong to Hamas or to Fatah. But the Hamas and Fatah, they are the dominant political streams that they are in existence in, in West Bank and also in Gaza. Uh, we, 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 we support the fact that for election, of course, and Mr. Abu Mazen, he is also supporting the fact of making election for the uh, representatives of the people on one hand and also for local authorities and also for the presidency and he is trying his best to coordinate this with all the Palestinians with all political streams he has no objection I'm not talking you know I'm talking as you know as a Palestinian as let's say as a, an individual Palestinian I don't want just to talk in the formal way or I can talk also in my capacity as a mayor representing my people. My people, they are, they, they, they are pro-elections. When, 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 when we decided to make the election for the, for the uh, cities, it was postponed three times. Three times. And when I came for the election in 2012, we also we had huge difficulties in running and conducting the elections. So I don't think Abu Mazen, Abu Mazen, I think he is a bro doing election for all kinds of elections. 
and he is very supportive to the election from his point of view. Uh, but he wants to coordinate this with the people also in Gaza because we try our best to make unification. Uh, we try to, to, and the people in Gaza also, uh, some of them they want, of course, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the matter is so complicated now because, to be honest with you, from a political point of view, we have also regional interferences, uh, in, uh, in, in, which is not, of course, against our wish or our will, but anyway, you, we are not living in an isolated world. You know, now the political co complication all over the world is uh, not so easy to cope with and to deal with. So we are pro-election, even the president is pro-election. He is, he, he is supported from the vast majority of the Palestinians, even until today. Uh, he did a very good you know, job in, uh, in, in, at the political level, international-wise. He put the Palestinian uh, on the map even uh, when, we, when, when we went to the United Nations and we got the non-full membership agreement. 138 countries were in support for uh, uh, the Palestinians. That is not enough, as I mentioned in my talk, you know. When we come back to the influences uh, here or there, I tell you, no, this is, there is no room for influences. In, in, in West Bank, uh, the, the Palestinian Authority, it's an, uh, it, it is uh, running, you know, the West Bank, uh, and in Gaza, the, the also, the uh, Hamas is, uh, have some control over there, or, or the, the control. And in the West Bank, we have the control of the Palestinian Authority, which, which have all the political stream. We don't say in the West Bank we have only Fatah is controlling. No, it's, it's a system. It's a complete system. In the government, we have people in the government, uh, which is uh, a government for the whole Palestine, for West Bank and for Gaza. It's, uh, it's not a government that is representing the West Bank and is not representing Gaza. And maybe you have seen, you know, the, the, our... Uh, the problem is the performance now of the government subject to the international complication and the international, you know, dead end of from the progress of negotiations with the Israelis. That's put everyone in the government in a very, very big challenge, whether, whether the... Uh, whether the government is, uh, you know, even if the government is rechanged and we changed so many governments in uh, in, uh, in uh, the last uh, couple of years, but it is not easy job. It's very very complicated job, and I assure you that the Palestinians, they are pro their president until the election will take place, and whoever comes, it doesn't really matter. And for the government, they have really minimal things to work in because they don't have resources. They have hardly to go cover the salaries for the employees and the Palestinian people in Gaza and in West Bank. Really, they want uh, to end up this conflict, regardless if, uh, you know, the formation of the government in, in, in the West Bank and, the, and, and in Gaza, some people like it or they, they don't like it. At the end, you know, our, our uh, main goal and main target uh, is to have a Palestinian state on the basis of UN uh, resolutions. I, uh, question at the back, Peter. Uh, Peter Kovach, uh, retired U.S. Foreign Service officer, uh, and one that did his thesis work on the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, I am wondering, Excellency, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'd like to get your perspectives on the boycott and divest movement. Uh, you seem to think that economic prosperity uh, is a kind of uh, basis of peace. And I suspect you're a very astute observer of the Israeli political scene, too. What do you think the likelihood of this boycott movement uh, that's here in certain left-wing circles, but in Europe far more prevalent, is going to be? Actually, the boycott issue is very important and a very sensitive issue for both sides. Uh, our economy and their economy, they are really interconnected. I cannot say that uh, uh, the, uh, the two economies are not uh, related. No, they are interconnected to each other because our market is a cons consuming market to their products and 
they also import from us our products that is competes with in prices to their products. So at the local level, we do really have interaction uh, and overlapping, and uh, the market is shared. But uh, when you, you, when you talk about the boycott, the boycott is I don't I link it to the political. Uh, uh, problem now. The political issue is very uh, important. Uh, sometimes the boycott is not for the sake of boycott. It's, it's for the sake of uh, political pressure. It's not uh, the matter of, uh, you know, when 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 we when we hear Mr. Netanyahu and uh, saying that uh, we will not convert one donum of land or one. Yeah, one donum is one thousand meters. You know, square meter. You know. Uh, we will not convert it from Area C to become Area B under the Palestinian control. This makes more, you know, challenge. This makes like uh, like uh, that. Uh, this makes more pressure on the Palestinian leadership to face their people. So this makes also lots of tension because we are looking for. Our, de our economy and our development and to convert barriers from C to B. And when the Prime Minister says no, this as this he is putting lots of obstacles on our self as leaders and on our leadership, uh, the government, the, the president, etc. So we have also uh, the, the uh, from the boycott from the academic point of view, this was not uh, raised this year or in the last couple of months, this was about 15 years ago raised at the academic level. And when I was uh, in the Council of Higher Education, uh, the first people to raise the issue of boycott were from France, from Europe, from UK, from uh, even from America here. Some academic institutions, they were coming and observing and seeing what the institutions in Palestine are doing, what the institutions in Israel are doing, if there will be a conference in Tel Aviv, for example, the professors in Palestine would not be able to go and participate in the conference because they need to have a permit. Uh, when we had, you know, the, the, the attacks uh, and arrests and the closures of universities in the West Bank, we did not see any professor from the Israeli institutions condemning the Israeli military uh, action because university is independent. University should be respected. When you say the campus of university is is like you know it has its own uh, status, respect. So we did not. I was the president of a university that was closed in 2004 for nine months. I didn't receive any letter of support from any Israeli university president to say to send to his uh, government, we condemn such, such actions. Other, other than that, the mobility of people from universities to attend you know, lectures or to attend conferences, whether inside or outside, is very limited, subject to getting permissions from the Israelis. So that was the idea of the boycott came long time ago, not recently. But I can assure you that once peace will be really uh, resumed and things will move to the to, on, on the basis of equal rights and uh, on the basis of acknowledging the rights of the Palestinians to have their status recognized, there will be no room to talk about boycotts. Question here. David Abreu, uh, S. Stanley Abraham Center for Middle East Peace. Thanks for coming. Just a question. Uh, you said that this is not an intifada because the political stream is not participating in the violence. I wanted to know if you can comment on the Palestinian media that a lot of people have been criticizing is inspiring the younger generation to commit violence. Thank you. That kid is lost. Uh, what, what is exactly your point, the question? The, the, the media is, is uh, choking the young people to 
domestic violence. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I understand this point, but I'm uh, trying to, to, to figure out, you know, exactly the, uh, what he meant by raising this point. Actually, the local media, our local media, yes, uh, maybe they have uh, exposing, you know, so many pictures uh, which might, this might, uh, according to the interpretation of some Israelis and some uh, uh, politicians, that this might uh, make uh, more, uh, you know, attention and uh, might make, you know, people to think for increasing the tension. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, Local local media, they were just translating or transferring the accidents that that took place. When, for example, in Al Shuhada Street, I give you an example. This is you know might reflect to other uh, cases, and that's maybe can give you a picture why the media is doing that. When the one of the boys about 20 years or 18 years old. He's working in painting from Khawasmi family. He was bypassing Al Shuhada Street. Not he's not allowed to go through Al Shuhada Street, but, but he was from the beginning of Al Shuhada Street passing the checkpoint and he is going to his work. So he was in that area, his work in that neighborhood. Uh, so he was shot dead by a settler. He was he he, he never had anything to or any any thinking even he was going to his work he did not have a knife he did not have a weapon or nothing uh, so he was shot dead by a settler and the media uh, you know the the you know by i don't know how things because uh, happened you know one of the media over there because most of the time the media is at the entrance of al shuhada street in most you know, cases, because we have so many people comes to from international to see Al Shuhada Street. So at that moment, there was a camera from the media, from one of the, not local media, I don't, I don't think it's a local media. It monitored that the soldier is passing the knife to, and put it next by to the body after it was shot dead. Immediately after that, the ambulance came to pick up the, the, the body, but the, the ambulance was not allowed to pick up the body. So they kept the body bleeding until the, 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 the person lost his life. And then it was taken also by an Israeli ambulance later on after I think 45 minutes or one hour, something like that. So the, our media, they have to tell our people, what's what 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 happened? So, the the first message is why they are not allowing the ambulance to pick up the body. The second important point is when the soldier was passing the knife to another soldier and laying it next to the body. So that's also, you know, it comes like uh, things that has to be. In, Informed to the people what's really going on, and many cases happened like that. That's why, in my speech, my introduction said, we could have saved 55 out of 57 if the intention was not to kill. Because you know, school uh, school lady, uh, 16 or 17 years of age, goes to. Al Ibrahim Mosque. She has to go through security gates, electronic security gates. The soldiers are fully armed. I can't, in my mind, imagine that the that the lady, even if she carries a knife, as the claim of the soldiers, they could easily control her and grab her hand, uh, arrest her, because. She's facing military uh, soldiers, well trained and well equipped with weapons, and the uh, lady or the school girl, she's armless. So that happened, you know, uh, many times. So the media, they do not have any way except to take those 
and to tell the people what's really going on in order to push the leadership to uh, really exert uh, uh, impose some pressure on the international community in order also to put some pressure on the Israeli government not to use excess use of force. We have really told the Israelis many times that you really should not give your soldiers and your settlers orders to shoot from a distance if you think that that person or that lady is a threat to you. You can easily, in the past, before they used to search or to capture or to arrest, but we never saw things like what happened in the last couple of weeks couple of months. And when they say it is uprising, no, this is not uprising. I'm telling you, this is the fact. It is not uprising, and nobody is really behind what happened, except this is, you know, a feeling of the people, especially started in the in, in, in end of uh, uh, September, when some Israeli sol uh, soldiers, Israeli settlers, entered inside the court of uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And why you said it spread it to Hebron, spread to other cities? I can tell you why, you know, easily, very simple things. Hebron and Jerusalem are interrelated, interconnected. Hebron, they have the settlers inside Jerusalem, they have the settlers inside Jerusalem. 60, over 60% 60 of the people who lives in Jerusalem are originally from Hebron. So this is very important fact. So you cannot separate the two communities who are living next by to each other about 35 kilometers. But now I cannot pass 35 kilometers to go to Jerusalem. I have to go around Wadnar, around you know, any other complicated routes, and I cannot go inside Jerusalem without having a permission. Even Ashwada Street, which is in my, under my authority as a mayor, I cannot walk in Ashwada Street. Why? Because it is closed by the military. It is closed for three years, by the way. The three years has, have been gone, finished, completed. But the military, every six months, they re renew the closure. Uh, I was told by the Israelis, you as a mayor, we can give you permission to go through Ashwada Street. I said, no. It doesn't make sense for me as a mayor to walk and use Ashwada Street and to leave 700,000 or 800,000 inhabitants in my district not to use the Ashwada Street. Either we use it all or we don't use it. Last question. Right there. Hi, my name is Abad and I'm a um, conflict resolution student at George Mason University. My question is, if you were to be the Palestinian president, what would you do differently? To resolve this issue, you have all the power in the world. Regardless who is going to be the president, you know, anyone who will come after Abbas, the, the, as a Palestinian, if you want really to represent the people and to do to the people what they want, he has to work for a Palestinian state. Otherwise, he will not be uh, accepted to be a representative of the Palestinians. Well, uh, we cannot do that differently if we don't really have the support of the international communities, and particularly the United States of America. I know the United States of America since I was living here. I know the system, the culture, the political uh, system, but without really imposing some power and pressure on Israel, it is not easy. We have uh, support of international communities, but it's not uh, enough. We have to get, you know, to convince the American people, to convince their leadership, to convince their senators that we have our rights to live like the Israelis, they have their right also to live. And we respect everybody. Thank you. Well, on that note, thank you very much.